Welcome to today's event in our long-running series from Manuscript to Marketplace. We're here to discuss Nine Tales. Nine Tales by Sally Wen Mao, a beautiful short story collection. Uh, these events are basically case studies on the path to publication. Uh, we get to talk about the book and give writer-to-writer -writer advice on what goes on behind the scenes and how the industry is doing things these days. Uh, thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Arts and our donors, the Authors Guild Foundation is pleased to offer this program free to the public. Be sure to check out authorsguild.org for info about guild membership and all the free public stuff that we do to help writers. Uh, joining us today is Sally Wen Mao, author of the story collection Nine Tales and previously three acclaimed award-winning poetry collections. Claire Mao is a literary agent at Sanford J. Greenberger Associates, where she represents adult fiction and nonfiction. Nidhi Pugalia is an editor at Viking Penguin, working on fiction and nonfiction. And our moderator, uh, welcome back, Lily Philpot, a writer and writing event expert. Glad to have you here with us, everyone. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lily. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you to everyone who's joining us during your lunch break or morning coffee break, wherever you are in the world. We're so excited to talk about Nine Tales um, and the its journey onto our shelves. I hope you have a copy. And if not, please go to your local indie bookstore bookshop.org and grab one. Um, I want to start off with asking Claire and Nidhi to talk a little bit about um, their work beyond their official titles and actually maybe beyond Nine Tales as well, you know, just like the day-to-day -day work of an editor and an agent to kind of lay a foundation and then we'll get into the story of the book. Um, Claire, can I ask you to start? Yeah, of course. Um, thank you, Lily and Johnny, for um, having all of us. Um, and so I guess um, to kind of briefly talk about what I do as an agent, um, I work with authors to sort of prepare their work for publication. Then I kind of take them through the process of submission, um, negotiating a deal, um, and then uh, negotiating the contract, and then sort of um, specific to an author and book's uh, lifetime, you know, I'm there for general support for that book, whatever that looks like, um, whatever that author and editor and publishing team needs. And then on a more macro scale, I also sort of um, consult with an author or sort of, you know, help them on their path, um, you know, kind of managing their life and career as a writer in general. So um, it's a position that definitely doesn't, that, you know, focuses both on the single book, but also the career as a whole as well. Um, so with Sally, um, I work with writers, I think, at many different uh, points in their career, um, you know, writers who have published books, writers who have never published books, um, writers who maybe weren't even thinking about writing a book. Um, so it's it's very special to be able to kind of, you know, do things at all, um, you know, to sort of see writers through all stages. Um, and yeah, like mentioned earlier, I do both. Uh, I work solely in the adult space, so no children's or young adult. Um, but, you know, I work across uh, fiction and nonfiction. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it over to Nidhi. Hi, um, thank you again to Lily and Johnny. Um, and I, as an editor, it's it's kind of a wide span. I like to say that it's a misnomer of a title, really. Um, I would say project manager is probably better. Um, and I work, Claire will send me a manuscript, like she sent me this one, or agents will send me manuscripts. And so part of my role is acquisitions um, every week. Um, and I'm reading through submissions. And then I'm, after I consider them, let's say I pursue them, um, then, then we move to the editorial stage, which is really maybe one fourth of my job. Um, and then there's the project management where we're not just after we finish editing and talking through projects, which could be anywhere from, I would say, two to five rounds, I think, in my experience of editorial rounds. Um, after that, we move into what's called the production stage, which is everything from copy editing um, and proofreading to actually seeing designed pages and thinking about things like font and presentation. Um, and I help maneuver through that process and then finally publication. And I'm also the kind of main hub for the author and the agent for Claire and Sally or anyone else um, to talk to marketing, publicity, art, um, any other department within within Penguin Random House, or just any random questions 
um, that might come up. I'm the point person for answering all of those questions. Um, but but yeah, so um, Sally is a great example of the kind of books that I work on. I am primarily working on speculative fiction at Viking Penguin, and it's a pretty broad range. It's everything from um, the literary with with parts of with even a thread of the magical to it. Um, all the way to full-on witches and and wizards and monsters um, set in usually a grounded world, um, but still with some sort of history of magic in it. So it's a very wide range. It's very exciting um, to be able to work in that space. And then I do have a little bit of romance. I have a little bit of nonfiction. Um, and of course, I publish short stories kind of across that span too. So it's an exciting space to be in. Amazing. It sounds exciting. Thank you both. I love that view as well. This like long-term view of a writer's life and career and work is so helpful. And I think helps us pivot into my question for Sally, which is sort of how the short story manuscript came together. Obviously, as Donnie mentioned, you've already published, you had already published three poetry collections. And I know there was a lot of interest in that pivot from poetry to short fiction. Um, I'm also really interested to hear you talk about, because I, I think, and correct me if this is wrong, but I had read that you were a Coleman Fellow at NYPL when you started writing this, um, mm -hmm. which is such an amazing fellowship program, such an amazing organization. And I'd love to hear how that might have inspired, affected, guided this, um, how Nine Tales became a manuscript. Thank you so much, Lily, and um, thank you so much, Claire and Nidhi. Um, I, I started, you're right, I did start this manuscript. Um, I, start, I started drafting the first stories of the manuscript um, back when I was a Coleman Fellow at the New York Public Library. And uh, I think at the time, I was still primarily writing poetry, but I wanted I, I, I was feeling a little restless, so I wanted to try to write something um, in a different genre for fun. And um, the first the first month of my fellowship, I felt like you know the world was my oyster. I was here in this um, in this library. I could order whatever book I wanted and have it just delivered to that space. <laughs> And I, I was going to the library every day to, to work on a project. But at the time, the project that I had proposed was my second book of poetry, Oculus. And I had just gotten my um, contract for that book. So I, I really needed a new project. So I, I decided I was going to write um, a story about a nine-tailed fox um, trying to date in contemporary New York City. And, and and so yeah, I wrote a, that story, and I was I think I was describing it to a friend of mine, and she said, "Well, you should actually you should write like a whole book of of those." And then I thought to myself, "I'm like uh, I don't know, like w will is there enough there?" And then um and then what happened is I I went down a really really large rabbit hole, um and I found like all of these different things I didn't know about this like mythological creature um because I, I thought it was just like a trope you know in a in in like in that I would see peripherally in in different tv shows like in in Chinese palace dramas or in Pokemon right you have the nine-tailed fox um and so I decided that my project uh was going to be working on a draft of a story um, that's in some way related to the nine-tailed fox um, each month that I was at that fellowship. So so every month, there were nine months, right? There were nine months, nine tails, nine tails. I thought, oh, wow, this pun is so obvious. I, I hope, <laughs> you know, I hope, um, I hope I get this actually done I at the time even even when I completed the nine months at the um New York Public Library I wasn't I was still very like unsure of myself um as a fiction writer I thought okay maybe maybe if I could get um somebody's eyes to look at this um maybe maybe that would help me like actually flesh out this project because that that fellowship it was from 
2016 to 2017. So it was a while ago. And I think at the time, like right around that time, I think it was, I, I, I think I might have met Claire um, around that time. I, I think it was just by chance too. I just like ran into Claire at, um, at a gift store. <laughs> And we we have the same last name. Um, we're not related though, <laughs> so we <laughs> so we connected on that being a Mao. Um, um, but then but then we exchanged info, and it like it uh, like it took me a while. Um, and I, I I'm sure we'll talk about this later. Um, like finding and choosing an agent, but I think I think once I had somebody who who was looking at my work um, on a consistent level that that's when I started to really feel like oh this is a project that can can you know materialize it, it can maybe turn into something real um, I didn't really believe it until like just a few months ago when it when the physical copy actually arrived right um, so so yeah as a poet I I written I've been I've been writing poetry for most of my career and, and entering into the fiction space it's completely different um I think because uh because as a poet I always had to kind of be my own agent I had to submit things um to contests or to um or to publishers just just directly um and I I didn't have a liaison um for 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 my poetry um and 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 entering into like the prose space, I realized that there's a whole different um different set of uh, I guess like set of conventions there. Um so so yeah, I I I thought of it as like a fun new adventure and I and I was really sort of excited to go somewhere like new. Um yeah, so <laughs> Amazing. And actually, Claire, can I ask you to tell like your side of that story of meeting in a gift shop and bonding over the same surname, but then, you know, years or however long it was later receiving the manuscript and starting to work together um, on, on making it what it is now? Um, sure. Yeah, I I'd actually forgotten that that was how Sally and I had <laughs> met um, until I think she reminded me, um, I, you know, a couple a couple months ago. But um, I mean, I'd actually always been a fan of Sally's writing um, as a poet. So, you know, for me, when when we met, um, you know, when she introduced herself, I I knew who she was uh, or in the sense that like, oh, I love your work. Um, but yeah, Sally's right. I think we met at the gift shop at the Ace Hotel and we met because one of Sally's friends was working there, which is maybe why Sally was there. And I think I had just stopped in. Maybe also like a friend of mine had known the friend who was working there. Um, so we we're all there in this uh, in this gift shop. <laughs> um, and again, I'd known Sally so worked previously as a poet. I think um, at the time, maybe Sally was already in her fellowship, um, but she mentioned working on the short stories. And at the time, I mean, if that was 2016 or 2017, I would have been, um, I think, still an assistant at um, an agency, so still not quite an agent in my own right yet. Um, but, you know, I think even then I knew that the kinds of authors I wanted to work with, the kinds of books I wanted to work on were um, authors like Sally. You know, I personally love it when sort of um, writers uh, do kind of that cross genre work, um, you know, poets who are then short story writers or, um, you know, fiction writers who decide to turn to memoir, things like that. So, you know, I think I was really excited to hear that Sally was working on fiction. Um, and um, yeah, so I think I'm I'm not sure like when exactly we like sort of formalized our relationship, but um, you know, I think it helped that we kind of met through this sort of um, I guess like non-professional setting, but um yeah, and Sally and I are are in community get together. We have a lot of mutual friends as well. So I think that all, you know, just sort of helped um in sort of, you know, I think with an agent, editor, writer relationship, it's very close. You know, you spend a lot of time working together. So I think it's um, just really nice to feel like someone who you're working with or working for um, is also someone who you would just also like to hang out with. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's how Sally and I met. Absolutely. And then it's, I want to I'm like ping pong back and forth and get like both sides of the relationship. But Sally, as you kind of like 
dive deeper into this fiction world and realize that, oh, you're going to need to find an agent. I'm going to have to do the whole querying process in the manuscript. Did you have like a, a dream agent in mind and not maybe a particular person, but just like the type of agent, the, their type of working style? Um, how did you think about that going into it? Yeah, this that's a great question. I think I think I was utterly unfamiliar with the world of like agents and writers and like the that relationship. Um, and but I I was aware that it existed, <laughs> and um, Claire sort of Claire sort of showed interest in in me. Um, like I I remember she like she like sent me an email pretty, pretty, pretty soon after I met her. And I think at the time, I just was really unsure of like, how that world even worked. Like, I, I'd never even heard of like querying. I, I know I'm a writer, but I'm a poet. So like, in the poetry world, we don't like we we query on like to the editors, you know, at least I did that with my second book, uh, Grey Wolf. I, I remembered I queried the editor being like, are you reading new manuscripts? Um, uh, but there's something I think in my mind, there's something really magical about not having to be that person <laughs> to to do that uh, because it's always really embarrassing, you know, like, um, oh, here's like something that I wrote. Um, so I, I like the idea of getting an agent and Claire was one of the first people to reach out to me. Um, and at the time, I think I think I think I did get the advice that I should like look into like what kind of agent I'm looking for what um what ideally you know what 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 what's my vision and I on I mean to be really honest with you I don't really have like like a like a clear vision um but I did I did speak with a couple of other agents um before going with Claire like I I spoke to an agent that was pretty um I, I I had heard of like every like the person the people the writers that she worked with um were re like writers that I really admired and you know I, I like she was pretty I think she was at that point pretty established and had a I think I had a meeting with her and um and and you know I I, I thought it went went well um but there was a but but you know, later on there, I felt like there was a difference between like um, responsiveness, right? Um, like like between between that agent and Claire, it seemed like Claire was really always on top of um, our communication. And, um, and, and I also remembered that like, I sent a few stories to Claire and Claire was um, willing to offer me advice and feedback. And it, it seemed like she, she was like, willing to work with me even even though I hadn't like actually yet assigned like um like officially signed with her um so I felt like I felt like 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 the what led me to like the ultimate decision to go with Claire is is that I felt Claire really understood my audience um I felt also that Claire is a part of like my target audience for my book right like um I I I, I and I and I also, you know, there, there's something like Claire, like mentioned that she was um, an assistant um, at Jenklo uh, back then. And, and and there's something about Claire's ambition that really like it, 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 it spoke to me, right? Um, she was young, she was, you know, she was really looking for like her clients and like she was really building that from scratch. And like now, you know, I feel like Claire is a pretty established agent with many different clients and like many different like success stories with her books so I felt really you know like like back then it like I I I I felt like my decision was like the right one just because uh like I felt like Claire mentioned in community with Claire and and so if we're sort of in the community together we can we can kind of work on this project um to to bring it out to that community um, I love that. Um, and Nithi, I want to sort of loop you in as like the final member of this dream team as it all came together. Um, I'm curious to hear if you remember your first impressions of the manuscript, like how it first crossed your desk. Did you know Sally's poetry work? Um, and then sort of what like sparked the fire in you to acquire this book um, and to to help it get out into the world. 
Um, I went digging in preparation for this conversation, so I can remember exactly what my impression was, which is, I wrote, so Claire reached out in um, 2022, um, so two years ago, I don't know how that time has passed, um, but it was in 2022 summer, um, and I read through, and the first line of my email to Claire is, Sally absolutely blew me away with this collection, um, and so it was immediate, it was immediate love, um, I thought that it was just completely stunning, um, a fabulous collection that felt like it moved, it just moved me in every single facet um, of the experience of, of this box. And what I loved about um, the nine-tailed fox within the stories is that it's not present in every single one of them, but the spirit of the fox is very much present. Um, sometimes it's in the background, sometimes it's of course over. We do have the story um, of a nine-tailed fox trying to date in the big city um, amongst many others, but but yeah, I I just remember feeling like it showcased so many, it was like a prism or a kaleidoscope. It just had so many angles um, that offered new depth on, on experience. And I um, was looking and continue to look for stories that are set in this kind of speculative manner that are exploring questions about identity and about gender and about culture and about experience, especially from BIPOC or queer perspectives. And this did all of that and more. Um, so I, I knew Sally by name. I knew um, that she was a wonderful poet, but I had not read her collections. Um, but I do remember that when I said that I had this in, the outpour, so we have um, editorial meetings every week where we kind of present what titles um, we're currently reading and excited about to our team. And I presented it at that meeting. And I just remember the flurry of messages that I received from everyone saying, oh my God, I love Sally, that she's such a wonderful poet. It's so exciting that she's turning to prose. Um, so the whole team was really behind it at Viking Penguin and really excited to to receive it. Um, so, so that was thrilling. Amazing. Oh, I love that. That's so wonderful. Um, I'm going to go back quickly to Claire and ask, as you and Sally worked on the manuscript, how did you think about pitching this to a publisher as, you know, a short story manuscript um, versus a novel? So are there different ways that you approach those emails that you might send to someone like Nithi who's going to be reading it? Um, did you also work and try and place, for example, like, a story in a online magazine or um, pitch in different ways to just like get them out there in the world? How does that work? Um, yeah, so Sally and I, we um, did work on it a lot. <laughs> we did, we went through a lot of um, edits on the sort of agent side as well. Um, I think there's this sort of convention in publishing that, you know, short story collections are hard. Um, publishers may not want to take um, a chance on them you know, they don't sell very well, things like that. I guess for me, like, I personally love short story collections. So I think that, um, you know, there is a feeling of like, you know, maybe kind of like willful ignorance on that front where it's like, well, if I love something this much, like maybe someone else will too. Um, and, you know, I will say that I found the response to Sally's collection actually very invigorating. I think there were, there was a lot of interest. Um, obviously it was helped by the fact that Sally was, um, you know, previously published writer, you know, she had a lot of fans um, for her poetry. I think the writing is obviously undeniable. So I think it makes sense that there were people who, um, we're also very interested in, in like you was mentioning, like in her, um, you know, fiction debut. Um, and then in terms of, so I think that was, so, I mean, I think it was a, it was a real sort of alchemy of, you know, um, Sally sort of having this previous track record, um, the, the stories themselves. Um, we did end up selling the book in a two book deal. So there was an novel attached, um, which, um, you know, <laughs> to come, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think, I think that sometimes, you know, people think that, you know, you can't sell a short story collection unless you have a novel attached. I guess I like to think of it more as, you know, a publisher, like my goal as an agent is to find a publisher who wants to build an author's career and to have that sort of investment, um, 
and that sort of, uh, you know, willingness to uh, want to be Sally's publisher for not just this book, but for, you know, her prose fiction career um, into the future is something that is, I think, really wonderful. And I think, you know, for Sally as well, um, she'd written these stories and, you know, she had, had an idea for, for a novel that she was um, working on, you know, it was in very early stages, but I think it's always exciting to be able to show that, you know, an author is, also themselves thinking about their career um, into the future as well, that beyond this book, this, you know, collection of stories, that there is something else that they're excited about, that they're also invested in building their own career. Um, and then in terms of uh, submitting short fiction before the um, book went on submission, so I think a sad reality is that there are fewer and fewer places to submit um, short fiction to. So you know, we tried a lot of, um, you know, places that do still submit. I think Sally also has a lot of amazing connections from, um, you know, her own experience submitting poetry and working with different literary magazines and editors. So um, if I'm wrong or correctly, I believe that um, maybe like two or three of the stories had been published prior to the book coming out um, or prior to like book submission. But um yeah, I think that was, I think it's also like, you know, something about wanting to, you know, be able to sort of hold on to enough of the story so that when the book comes out um, as well, there's also sort of an opportunity to then kind of promote the book in that way by, you know, like submitting and accepting short stories as well. Amazing. I'm very excited to hear that there's a novel coming. Sorry, Sally, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll just chime in. I guess, I guess in terms of like the, like submitting individual stories, that's something that I, I was a little bit more familiar with as, um as a poet, like the, I feel like the difference between poets and fiction writers in terms of submitting literary, to submitting to literary journals, like that, that, that's a little more negligible than like the, the process of, um, submitting like books for publication but like um but I I do think that there are like online journals and online um spaces that I I that do that publish fiction and I do encourage those of you who are working on like perhaps like essay collections short fiction collections even novels to 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 just like to try your hand at submitting these things uh, with or without an agent um often often if you submit if you get published in like uh like say um say like a uh, uh, joyland joyland is a great like uh, like um website publishes fiction um what happens is you know sometimes the agents will be reading you know these journals these um these uh magazines like looking for looking for like new talent looking for um writers and and that's honestly how a lot of my other friends have found agents like they have published their fiction through these other you know through through these other journals on online or even even um, in print um and and they've gotten like cold emails from agents so like i do think that that's like an under maybe an undervalued route um toward toward like seeking an agent um um i i i i i don't have like experience um uh, doing like the pitch letters and stuff but from what i gather from from people like that's a good that's a good way awesome that's yeah. super helpful to keep in mind and joyland definitely if you're not familiar with it take a look they publish excellent work um I want to talk about the process, the editorial process. Once the um, you have an agent, the manuscript manuscript has been acquired, um, and I'd love to hear Nikki and Sally what kind of editorial changes you make. Um, you made. I think this is true that in an earlier version there was a novella. If you read the book, um, oh no, now I'm not going to remember what it's called, The Haunting of Angel Island. Is that right? Um, so that had been included in full in a section and in the final version, it is broken up throughout the book. And I think Nithi, it was your recommendation that that be broken up and interspersed throughout the text. And I'm so curious, like, what made you think that that was going to make the book sing? Why was that necessary? Um, 
And Sally, too, like, how do you approach that kind of, you know, major structural revision that involves slicing a novella into pieces, figuring out where it might fit? Um, that sounds stressful. <laughs> I'm always curious how writers do it. Um, but maybe, Nithi, we can start with you. Sure. Um, yes, we had. So after Sally and Claire went through their rounds of edits and sent it over to me, um, it is very rare that an editor won't have their own several rounds of edits. So it's also nice to keep some looseness to the manuscript, some energy so that, you know, you can dive in. And um, we had a couple, I think I would say maybe two big changes. Um, one was we replaced one short story. Um, <laughs> entirely so um we looked at a couple options Sally went back and looked at an, a, a, another couple stories because she had written more right um than these than than the original nine um during that sojourn of writing about nine-tailed foxes of course she also had plenty of other ideas and short pieces um and we ended up picking one of those and expanding it so she didn't have to start from scratch um but that was one major change. And then the second one, like you said, was turning that novella into this woven piece. Um, and we had we went back and forth a lot about it. Um, and it was very much, you know, I feel like my role as an editor is um, a lot of recommend recommending, um, but it's not a command. Um, it might be passionate recommending, um, but it's not a command. And so we went through, um, I think, if I remember correctly, three different options. One was just keeping it at the end as a novella, as it was submitted. Um, and then there were two other ways to kind of break it up. Um, and one version that was not the final version was just having the kind of opening, almost like an invitation. Um, and then I believe the rest of it was still going to be at the end. But the one we finally landed on was this kind of woven piece. And I think part of the conversation around it is, or was, is this too unexpected? Um, will readers be confused? Will they, um, especially short story collection readers who are used to a particular kind of experience, will they feel alienated by it? Um, and I think the two ways that um, we ended up feeling was, A, it's always nice to be innovative and it's always exciting to be innovative, um, especially when it feels true to, true to the story to be that way. Um, and we never want to be restricted by how things have been um, done in any in any format. Um, and then the second part was just it felt, first of all, the opening part one, book one of um, The Haunting of Angel Island felt like such an invitation. It felt like such an opening and a way to present how to read every short story collection that was coming. Mm -hmm we're about to step into and that was really beautiful it's why I um remember suggesting it is because of that invitation and that context that was being given um and then I just felt like it was a thread that could seam together the themes of every short story especially mm -hmm. because we're coming back to the same setting but each book each piece was about new characters at Angel Island. It wasn't necessarily this, that you would lose the information or lose the context that you had from the previous book of The Haunting of Angel Island. Um, and it just felt like it was this spine for the book that would be able to take the readers um, and also give them a space to breathe in between a couple short stories um, and remind them of that invitation, remind them why they're here. And then it ended um, on the longest part, longest book. I keep thinking of them up as books. I don't know why. Um, but longest piece of Angel Island um, was still the culmination. And that was kind of like an exit. Now we've left. Um, and in a way, it almost seemed like all of these short stories were in a mythical Angel Island, even if not literally on it. Um, so I, I, yeah, it, it was, I'm really glad that this is where we landed. I hope you are too, Sally. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it to Sally. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was such a wonderful, comprehensive um, answer to that question. So um, for people in the audience, there, there was um, a novella within this collection that I, originally uh, Claire and I decided um, it should be in the end, right? And because, because you know, I like having read many sh short story collections, I've seen this before, right? I've seen, I've seen collection of stories plus novella. 
um, that that was sort of a format that I have have seen other people do. So I felt comfortable doing that kind of thing. Um, but the haunting of Angel Island, it's also there's like there's like nine parts within and um, and within each part, there is sort of it follows a different character and um, and and the the through line is this uh, immigration station in San Francisco Bay Area um, that existed between 1910 and 1940. And it was where a lot of Chinese immigrants in particular were detained because it was built essentially to um, to enforce the Chinese exclusion laws. And um, and I I actually had this back and forth with Nitty about uh, like her suggestion, which seemed so radical at first to me was to break up the the um, novella and place parts of it, intersperse parts of it throughout the collection. And I didn't think that like like Lily, you mentioned like logistically, I didn't actually think that lo logistically it was hard, but I think my my concern was like, like, how would this read to audiences? Like, like Nidhi said, I, I, I'm, will, will they think that it's like 15 tales, not nine tales, right? Um, um, but but I'm I'm like oh well if we put nine tails there, you know it like they maybe will be able to see that the that the haunting of Angel Island is just one long tail um, that's interspersed throughout and in the end I'm actually really glad that I was able to fracture that story because the idea of it um, is is about these immigrants kind of making this. Um, journey and and the first thing that happens to them as they like debark from the ship is that they're separated right like the families were separated um the 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 men go in this one building and then the women and children go in this other building and for the duration of their detention they're just separated um and so that fracturing the fracturing of that novella the fracturing of the narrative actually i think spoke to the content of it um and so in the end i i decided you know after i've like i talked to a bunch of people about this like decision and i i, I think in the end it was the right decision and i I'm so grateful that Nitty, like what a fantastic editor is able to like have that vision you know <laughs> Yeah, I also think it just is so natural. And I, I wanted to ask you about it specifically because I read that in another interview and was really surprised because it, I had not understood that it was written as a whole. It feels like it just weaves. I love you said that it was like a spine for the book. It really feels like it's such an integral part in those sections. Amazing. Um. There, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off piece slightly from the questions that I prepared, but I want to ask just about like relationship, like agent author relationships. So like as this is happening, when Nithi, there and Sally are having conversations about the novella, breaking it up, doing it in different ways, like maybe people are gonna think it's fifteen tales, it's not nine tales. Like where are you? Like what kind of conversations are you having with Sally and maybe with Nithi as well? Like how are you all kind of balancing that relationship? Um, yeah, so I think the um, you know, really special thing about being an agent is that um, you know, I think I can really sort of plug in um where necessary. And it really kind of depends on each individual author. Um, different authors have very different relationships um, with their editors and with their agents. Um, I think because I felt very strongly about this project, and I think because Sally and Dee are both amazing at sort of, um, you know, kind of really creating a, uh, you know, a real community around the book. Um, you know, I was very included in a lot of these conversations. I think there were some, you know, maybe the kind of um, more like uh, nitty gritty back and forth between Sally and Nitty that I wasn't always, um, you know, looped in on. But for the most part, you know, a lot of the major edits I got to see, um, Sally and Nitty were both amazing about, you know, kind of asking for my opinion as well if they needed a third, fourth, et cetera opinion. Um, so I was part of the conversation about um, breaking up the novella. So I think at first I may have been the naysayer actually, um, just because I, so I guess <laughs> maybe as a contrast to Nidhi, I love how the novella ends and I think it's a perfect way to end um, the, the collection. So I think I was worried about the impact of that beautiful ending being lost. Um, 
-hmm. but ultimately I think that the decision that was made was the right one because I do think that like Nidhi was saying it kind of really weaves through the collection and pulls it all together because I think sometimes maybe that is the um response to short story collections is a feeling that and I think that's something that you know maybe Sally and I also talked about obviously Sally's book has such a strong cohesive concept um as she was writing it but you know I do think some short story collections can sort of feel like well, you know, I have like a book length collection of short stories. And so I just love, you know, I think that having that conversation about the intention behind a short story collection, you know, why these stories, why this order. Um, and I think even the the story switch that happened um, that Sally and Edie talked about earlier um, was also really crucial to the book as well. You know, I think there were a lot of considerations that went into which stories made it into the collection, what order they were placed in, um, you know, making sure there was a good balance um, of all the stories that went in that, you know, I think that kind of intentionality behind a short story collection is to me what makes it, and, you know, it remains such a special, um, you know, sort of subgenre of fiction, I guess, um, you know, in that, like, it can be a short story collection, they can be very tightly woven, um, you know, as much as and explore many of the same themes and, um, you know, like have a similar narrative arc as a as a as a novel, but maybe um, just in a different form. Mm. Mm. Oh, so interesting! Thank you so much. Um, I'm keeping an eye on our time because I want to make sure we have time for some audience questions. But I do also want to talk about the kind of like final phase of the book when editorial is done, um, the beautiful cover art has been chosen, the font has been, you know, assessed and, and picked, as, as Nithi was saying earlier. Um, when the book was done, you know, what kind of, because we also don't have a publicist on the call today, like, what kind of conversations did you have with the publicity marketing team at Penguin? Um, I kind of want to hear from all of you on this, like, Claire, you know, how are you participating as Sally gets ready to do a book tour? Um, I don't know if there's like media training, if you have found in the past that like a podcast interview works super well to sell books or a print interview or something like that. Um, and then Nithi, I'm, I'm interested on your end as well. You know, as you said, editor is a little bit of a misnomer. You are very involved in the full process. Um, how do you kind of help usher the book into its its final form out into the world? Um, I know there's a lot of questions. Maybe we can start with Sally and then go Nithi and Claire. Well, I, I was a little bit familiar with sort of the whole process um, just based on my poetry um, books from before, but I, I do want to say that there are differences um, when like moving into like Penguin Books, for example, right? Like I like I was able to meet like a full team. They were all like incredible. I I, I love like the, their creativity and just like um, the way that they were able to kind of help pitch help me pitch my book to a, to to like different bookstores for like the tour and um, the way they were able to um, even I mean even before that it's like the whole process of designing right and um, and illustrating uh, illustrations and the cover art um, like I like I actually wasn't expecting that I could get, get so involved um, in the designing and the cover art um, like that that like you know just from what I've heard before you know some people have no say in how um their covers were were developed um and and for me we were able to like choose the illustrator for the cover and then the and and this is something I've never experienced before but then the, the illustrator was able to read the book and then illustrate something after reading the book like that that's like specifically tailored to the book and and I was able to give you know feedback to like the different sketches like that was a a completely new process to me um because usually like as a poet I I um I'm used to like begging people begging people for permission <laughs> to use their like already existing artwork so that was really exciting and um and yeah, like I, I had a, you know, I had a great time with, with the, this team and especially with Nitty really helped ground me through all of it um, as, as we were, you know, uh, as we were, 
as we were in the thick of it, like this spring. Mm. Um, I got to see, uh, so I'm based in Seattle and one of um, one of Sally's tour events was in Seattle. I almost said one of Seattle's tour events was in Sally. Um, but, but that was really exciting. So I got to see her in person here which is great um but but yeah but I think every I, I agree with everything Sally said just in terms of um you know how much teamwork was involved um as the team kind of came together um we started with a kickoff call where all of us players Sally and I and then um our marketing publicity team um we're all on a call together and you start with kind of talking about hopes and dreams and goals. Um, and then, you know, there are, of course, the obvious ones about wanting to be in your intense bestseller or whatever, but there's also so much specificity to it. Um, and I think representation, especially when it came to the cover, was really important. Um, and wanting to have um, someone who knew this culture, knew this art, and knew these stories, and perhaps grew up with them designing it. Um, it was really exciting um, to see this cover and to see the number of pieces. Every every little, like Sally was saying, every little detail on that cover is pulling from a different story, which is so fun um, and creative. So that, that was really exciting. And then when it came to kind of the um, past the production of it and going into marketing and publicity, um, in many ways, I'm still the point person, but um, Sally also had a publicity point person and a marketing point person, people that she could reach out to directly, had the emails for, were, was receiving plans for. Um, they they kind of take charge of um, any reviews that are coming in, also pitching. And I think that that's something that's really interesting about book publication, which is from the second that I receive and fall in love with a manuscript like this, that's when the idea of pitching is coming. And um, Claire and Sally, correct me if I'm wrong, but in my mind, as I understand it, authors are considering, as, as they consider what editor to go through, yes, there are questions of money and publication, but there's also questions of vision and how is this editor seeing this? How are they pitching this book? And so when you choose an editor, you're also choosing that vision. And that initial vision is might be fine-tuned, might be tweaked, might change in small shades, but that is the vision that is carried through the editorial conversations and then fed to marketing and publicity who also read the book. Um, and then it feeds their pitching and how they're presenting it to outlets as well. Um, so that's just kind of a thread that weaves through the entire publication process. Really quickly before Claire answers as well, because there's been some questions. The illustrator is Wu Li Chen, W H O O L I Chen, um, an artist from Taiwan. They're on Instagram. Um, if you want to take a look, sorry, go ahead, Claire. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say I think that um, the exciting thing about publicity and marketing is that you know it's a real, it's a real sort of like beginning stage of the book entering the world, and that you know suddenly, or not suddenly, but, you know, the circle of readers is growing, um, you know, people are reading it, um, it's starting to kind of become, you know, it, it's become an object that, you know, people can, publicists and marketers can take to their team, salespeople can, you know, send to bookstores, to um, booksellers, and it starts to trickle out into the world in that way, and so I think that's a really exciting moment and you know it does become a bit like all hands on deck i think um you know sally obviously came into it with previous experience of having published books before having gone on book tours having done publicity marketing so in some ways you know she was familiar with that which is amazing um or at least you know has that sort of i know you asked about media training which um usually i don't think fiction writers um you know <laughs> are subject to but um you know i think uh Sally's experience did lead her to understand a way to talk about the book or, you know, to be able to have that practice of um, presenting her book in a public facing way to people, you know, convincing people to read it essentially, um, both internally, externally, and, you know, so people can then take that and uh, be able to pitch it to outside um, outlets as well. Um, and so I think it's um, a really special um, period of the book's life, you know, it, I would say our publicity marketing meetings usually happen, I want to say six months ahead of publication. Um, and then it really ramps up in the sort of, um, you know, two to three months before publication as like trade reviews come in, um, you know, we get bites from um, places that may want to excerpt the book or may want to interview Sally, or, you know, we get confirmation that people 
want to cover the book or it's on most anticipated lists, um, you know, things like that. So um, it, it's, it feels like something that, um, you know, it happens like very slowly and then suddenly it's happening very quickly. Um, but, you know, I think in that time, it's just uh, important. You know, I think everyone's talking about the books to their own, you know, individual networks. So even if something that doesn't feel like it's a direct pitch, maybe it's something that later on is like, oh, you know, because um, I or Nidhi or someone on the um, Viking publicity team mentioned it to someone maybe three months later, they're like, oh, actually, I'd like to cover it now. Or um, I would love to be in conversation with Sally um, at one of her tour events, um, things like that. So, you know, I think it's a lot of small things that outside of like official outreach channels all sort of build up to something that can look like a successful um, publicity and marketing campaign. And I think what Nidhi was saying earlier about um, looking at a publisher for the entirety of their vision and sort of the strength of their teams, not just on the editorial front, but on the marketing publicity front, you know, that is a really important part of it. Um, you know, I think publicity and marketing can be a very difficult part of um, the publication process. And obviously it helps when the author is very keyed in, when they have their own sort of uh, social platforms or public facing platforms. Obviously Sally is a previously published author so she has that name recognition as well but um you know it's hard to really accomplish a lot of things if you don't feel like another the publishing party is also equally as enthused and passionate about the project and i think something that i loved about um this publicity marketing campaign is that i think it was really creative i think that um like nitty mentioned a lot of her books do kind of straddle that speculative space. And I think what was cool was sort of seeing a lot of maybe like sci-fi fantasy um, publications or, um, you know, kind of really lean into the speculative aspect of um, Sally's book and to kind of get that attention from, you know, an area that Sally's hasn't been covered in previously, I think was a really cool, special part of that process. That's so fascinating because that just reminded me, Claire, that I think the first time I encountered this book was in a tour.com most anticipated list, which is typically a sci-fi and fantasy publication and stumbling upon this and being like, wait, Sally Wen Mao, the poet, is having and getting very excited and, and tracking it down from there. Um, I want to shift to some audience questions in our last like 10-ish minutes, a little less than 10 minutes. Um, a lot of what you've all been talking about is about, you know, relationships, community, um, and there were some audience questions about, you know, folks who might be older, disabled, not based in New York City, may not have that community where, you know, you walk into a gift shop and, and meet the person who ends up becoming your incredible agent. Um, I'm curious, maybe we can just do like round robins of um, other ways you might recommend developing that community. Um, I think publishing often is so like East Coast, New York City specifically based, um, but there are other ways to to get into this industry. Um, so any any advice, any thoughts on like online communities, other other ways to kind of get your books out there? Um, yeah, I can speak as an agent. Um, you know, I do think that there are, I think like Sally mentioned earlier, publishing short fiction essays, um, you know, things like that, I think are a great way to get um, the intention of um, agents or anyone in the public publishing industry. I think that may be something that um, is like a more practical, like, I don't know if you want to call it a tip, but I think having like a centralized website where, you know, someone can click through like, all of the history of your work is always really important. I think that um, I've seen many authors who maybe have written something that I really enjoy, but when I go to search for their other work, um, you know, if they don't have a website, it's hard to know like if they wrote something or if it's like a different person with the, the same name or, um, you know, like suddenly you're on like page six of Google search and you don't really know like where you are anymore. So I think like things that like make it easier for other people to find you and find your work um, is I think an important way. That's like a passive way I think of doing kind of, of publicizing yourself. Um, I think that uh, online there's a lot of great ways for people to meet people. I think um, X formerly Twitter, I think is, you know that's a way to do things. I think that, um, you know a lot of organizations such as Authors Guild or other places, you know do host um, free like webinars and workshops um, or even like talks and I think that the online talk it can be really um, informative even or really helpful 
Um, I think that something that for an agent is always helpful um, or that always, I'm sure, I feel like people always want to know is that to get attention from an agent is, you know, to show that you've done some research into my list and my background. I'm sure it's the same for publishers as well. Um, you know, I'm not going to send something to Nidhi that I know she doesn't publish, you know, or that she's not interested in doing. Like, I'm not going to send her like a YA book, for example. And similarly for me, I don't represent YA. Um, I don't represent, I don't usually represent sort of like hard genre. Um, so I think if I receive a query for something like that, then you know, it's, it's, it's like, I'm not even the right <laughs> agent for you. So I think um, doing your research in that way, I think uh, is always helpful. I do think it's obviously very hard to get the attention of agents and people who work in the publishing, um, publishing world. I'm not denying that. And I think every agent I know would say that they're doing the best that they can with, um, you know, kind of looking through queries. I do look through my query inbox every day. I don't always have a chance to respond, but, um, you know, there are queries that I do sort of um, you know, that I think are clearly not tailored for me or just not a right fit um, based, you know, just simply on my bio on my website. Um, so I think, you know, doing that research, um, you know, really making sure that the um, agent you're querying is, would be a good fit, would be a good advocate for your work as well um, is, is really important. Um, I agree with everything Claire said. I feel like that was a really, really great comprehensive list. Um, I think that the only couple things that I didn't even think to add is really emphasizing how much is available online. Um, I think everything from query resources, free query resources, there are also paid ones, but you can find free resources, um, just by Googling a little bit of what a good query looks like, um, what a good, what comps are, like all of those elements are available um, very easily online. So I think that um, I've, I've found that a lot of people don't actually realize that. Um, and I think that that's kind of a stem of, especially in the past four years, a lot of community has opened up online too. Um, even if it did exist before, I think it's burgeoned in a really big way. Um, and so I, I would, yeah, I would suggest X. Um, I would also um, suggest Discord. As far as I understand, I think that there are some um, groups on groups on Discord, either for newly agented people or people who are looking for agents. They're just groups um, that you can get invited into. And then there are also um, places like Tin House or other writing retreats um, that you can apply to um, that do have funding. Um, and depending on the given year often um there's a pathway to getting your application fee waived as well um and that's another way to build um build community so so yeah and then in whatever um place you are i think that new york is very um it, it the book world is still in new york but i also kind of think that that's primarily true for very literary readers um my authors are all over they're they're all over the place um and there is probably a group of writers um, nearby you somewhere, um, or if there isn't, if you are capable, you could grow it. So I would, I would turn to your community too, um, and that would be people that you're able to rely upon even as you do get an agent and an author um, and have bookstore events. Those are the people that are gonna come um, are the people around you. So that's just a few, few things. Um, are we out of time? Um... I think we have a couple more minutes. I would love to hear what you would say about building community. And then I have one more quick question for everyone um, and wanted to plug Authors Guild as well. These conversations are recorded. There are a ton of these from manuscript to marketplace conversations across different genres. So you can look those up too. Yeah, well, um, like first, great, great um, answers. Um, I think I think in, in my experience as a writer, um, there there are, opportunities you have to kind of like seek out the opportunities right so I was like looking very religiously for like the different the different like um I guess like summer programs um or or like uh, workshops um that might you know offer scholarships like um Nidhi said um you end up you know like a like Tin House I think is one of them um Siwani uh bread loaf um there there's there's like like I, I I think as a writer I just like had this built-in thing where I was like constantly looking 
for different like application deadlines and um and honestly I feel like like that was how I was able to kind of enter into some of these spaces and I was able to like have conversations with editors like I think a lot of um people also attend like the writing like the huge writing conference a AWP and I, when I was um still in grad school I would go I, I would attend these conferences and just walk around the bookstore and just talk to people right um um and and so like seeing if you have like a local book festival or literary festival I think is a really great um way to kind of tap into like like the your not just your community but perhaps like the larger literary world in general um they they a lot of these like um events like they bring in authors from all over the country right um and yes um all right <laughs> what what's your what's your question Lily <laughs> I know I know we've sort of oh sorry go ahead say one more thing which is um poetsandwriters.com so www.pw.org if you just search writing residencies they have like a full list and you can sort it by whether there's free admission where the state is, what state it's in everything so that might be a useful resource yeah I was actually going to mention that as well they have a constantly updated running list of um contests as well poetry prizes fiction prizes etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and it is pw.org as Debbie said um, my one last question is another quick round robin I just wanted to kind of end on a note of like a little bit of advice or encouragement from each of you in terms of like something maybe super practical like a tin house class or workshop that we were talking about or just like emotional advice to you this can be an emotional and difficult process dealing with rejection is hard for all of us um so just like a quick thought on that our, our audience can take away with them as they go back out into the world um I start with Claire maybe I'm going like clockwise according to my zoom screen <laughs> um sure yeah I think that um Okay, I think on the practical side, um, I think this is this requires a little bit more work, but something that I recommend sometimes my authors doing as well is to even just look at an author that they admire or um, an author whose publication a campaign they've admired and then literally seeing like who's reviewed them, who, where they've written for, what residencies and fellowships they've done, because usually if that's an author who's work maybe that you feel like you're in communication with, um, that you're, you know, in conversation with, or, um, you know, they've written a book that, you know, you really admire and whose career path you'd like to emulate, then I don't think it hurts then to just sort of see, again, who's covered them, what fellowships, um, contests, et cetera, they've won. Most authors uh, who have, like, websites or, you know, whether official websites or um, publisher websites, usually we'll have that information, you know, they'll say that, like, you know, Sally was a Coleman fellow, Sally has done like a Black Mountain Institute um, fellowship as well. Um, you know, she's been published at, you know, the Paris Review and other places. So I think um, it always helps to, you know, maybe look at an author whose career you admire, see where they've been published, um, where they've done a fellowship, and then, um, you know, just apply to those as well. And then um, in terms of encouragement, um, I guess for me, I think that, um, you know, I think that writing is a long, difficult, very oftentimes can be lonely process. It's hard to feel like um, the industry, you know, whatever that means, is often not, you know, it is very difficult to breach. Um, there's a lot of gatekeepers. I'm not denying that at all. But I think that ultimately, there are also a lot of pathways that exist outside of the traditional publishing sphere. And I think people have found great success um, in self-publishing, in publishing with indie presses that don't need an agent. Um, you know, those books have found exactly the audiences that um, the writers have hoped for. So I think that if publication is your end goal, then there are many options outside of you know the sort of big five traditional publishing outside of being agented um you know outside of all those things um obviously financially it's not always um feasible for most people but i think that if you feel really passionate about something about a something that you're working on i think that 
there is an audience for it. Um, and I do think that it may take a bit longer to find that audience. But um, yeah, I guess I believe that, um, you know, any writer who is passionate, who puts in the work, um, that they'll find their audience. Uh, Sally, can I ask you to go next? Hey, um, I guess, okay, I, 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 I did notice a couple of questions that maybe I wanted to like build into my answer, but um, I think, I think uh, one of the questions was about different conversations with different editors and like, like how, how to decide, um, like Claire and I, we, we went out and we submitted to like 30 some, it was a huge number of, of, of people. And I think I, I, I like went in like, just like, like, so with, with so many nerves. And I think, um, I think like it wasn't until toward the very end, we, we heard back from Nitty, but I, at the time we didn't have that many choices. Right. And, um, and I like, like the way that I, like, we, 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 we chose Nitty right away because I felt like Nitty had a similar vision. And I, I think that process is like, uh, like, um, who who ha who has who understands your project right like who understands your project on a fundamental level who can you talk to about about this who who is going to not lead you astray and that's like how we ended up with nitty but but uh, but i i wanted to also say that like as a writer who's been in this world for so long like there's always going to be rejection and there's always going to be like there's always going to be like envy like 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 like, you, like no matter where you are there like 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 this industry is really cutthroat it pits you against your best friends and and it doesn't you know like and it can feel really really like really like scary, scary at times right and 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 there there's a certain amount of immunity you have to build against rejection um but I say that like that, I, uh, but I say that even when you haven't been rejected, there's, there's still other things to consider. You're always going to feel rejected. And like, as, as long as, uh, you know, uh, uh, like you, you could develop like a healthy relationship to rejection. I think, um, I think that like, you know, you can, you can keep on going. Um, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and, and like, like there are times when I just like want to like ignore my existence as a writer and just like not think about like, how many copies my book is selling or like how many all of these things and and, and like just take a break just take a break and and I try to build myself like a build a break into into this like process um for for myself um where where I'm not putting all sorts of like kind of external pressure and uh, like if you find a reader that loves your book I think that's like worth it in the end right like one I love that I really love that too. Um, I, I will keep my answers super brief. Um, I think that in terms of the practical edge of things, um, I really loved everything that Claire was saying about kind of finding your favorite authors, especially not just your favorite authors, but the authors that you want to be like, um, like who do you want to write like, and to add to that list of where they've been published, um, and, um, what contests they 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 were they won prizes of also look at who their agent is that's going to tell you something about who to query and who you might love and you'll have a personal connection you'll be able to say something like listen claire i love sally and i was so inspired by x y and z and i love your list for these reasons and go so there's 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 a long list that's also what your comps will be so that that's really exciting and um a good place to look um, and then on the emotional thing, I, emotional side, I, this is going to be very much in line with what Sally and Claire said. Um, this is a really rough industry. There's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of hard work. Um, and unfortunately, and fortunately, um, but all agents are people, all, um, editors are people. And I can't even imagine what the number of queries are in Claire's inbox. Um, the number of submissions in mine is scary. Um, and I think that patience alongside um, having that that kind of in being in your as much as you possibly can to rejection, just just remembering to keep going, um, to keep writing, to keep working on your craft, 
even when it's hard to find the joy and create the joy when you can to distract yourself, whether it's from the copies of books um, that you've sold or not sold, or from the fact that it's been six months um, since you started clearing, all you need is one person to say yes. All you need is one person. And that person is going to share your vision. It doesn't matter if 25 people say yes and 24 of them want to completely shift everything that you were trying to do. You want a shared perspective and that's why it's so important and so exciting that we are all human because we can have that connection and that and that capability of bringing your dream to life. Um, so I'd hold on to that um, and I wouldn't let, you know, I, I know how many, I know how many months some people might have been in the query trenches but I would just keep going in whatever format you can, write something new, explore something new, experience other people's art and come back a new person and a new artist and don't let your ego get in the way. Um, yeah, that's it. I love that so much. I really, I'm very glad to end on that, like finding the joy, no matter where in what trench you are at the moment, editing, writing, querying, all of it. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over time. I feel there's like, simply too much wisdom in this Zoom room from all of you and just too much to say, but this has been so very, very special and so informative. So thank you all. Um, thank you to the Authors Guild. This is the beautiful book again, so you can scope it out in your local bookstore. Um, please get a copy. And now that you know the behind the scenes as well of figure out how the novella, you know, was, was broken up and, and how it works so beautifully like that. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah. So much. Oh, I Thank love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. box. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Many thanks are pouring in uh, to the chat box. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to our speakers. Uh, congrats on the book, Sally. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I love the series. It's always a little different. We switched up the genres, the sizes of publishers. Sometimes the uh, in-house publicist appears. You know, it's, it's always something a little different. So you can find recordings of older ones uh, on our website. And uh, our next one uh, in a few weeks will be at 10 in the morning Eastern time, which I know is odd, but uh, the author Anton Herr is in Korea and we worked out the time that way. We're very, very, very excited for that. And we'll, uh, we'll be sure to cover different kinds of books uh, in the months ahead. Thank you so much to Lily Philpot for making my job easy. And uh, yeah, one more time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Take care.